Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is David Bader, and I'm the uh, Director of Education here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask everybody if you have your, uh, your cell phones or anything like that on, if you can put them on mute or turn them off for uh, the duration of our lecture, that would be appreciated. Um, thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank our, our lecture sponsors, Gazette New Newspapers and the Courtyard Marriott, who helped to make uh, these lectures possible for, for all of us. Um, and tonight I'm very excited and, and pleased to welcome Dr. James Danoff Berg, who's going to discuss community based conservation to combat poaching of animals like rhinos. I think we'll talk a little bit about vaquita, but I think we're going to learn a lot about sort of the, the approaches that are, are maybe even best practice in, in, in conservation. Uh, Dr. Danoff Berg is the Director of Conservation at the Living Desert in Palm Desert, California, uh, and the founding director of Helping Rhinos USA. Uh, an educator, a conservation strategist, a biodiversity scientist focused on uh, human dimensions of conservation, Dr. Danoff Berg has been a consultant on sustainable community-based conservation to the governments of the Dominican Republic, Cambodia, United Arab Emirates, India, and Japan. He has been a professor and researcher at Columbia University for 14 years and currently has an appointment at California State University, San Marcos. He has served as Director of Conservation Education at the San Diego Zoo and as an independent researcher and evaluator for zoos and aquariums around the world, including here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Uh, he's earned a PhD in biology from the University of Kansas, after which he was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Vermont and a Samuel Research Fellow at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, he was 14 years on, on one coast of, of, the, uh, of the country and now back here in his permanent home. He does not want to leave because we have the, the better side of the coast, I think. And I'd really love to introduce you and uh, hope you enjoy the lecture from Dr. Danoff Berg. Thanks, Dave. And uh, thanks to you all for being here today, too. Uh, I want to uh, thank Dave for the, the, the invitation to come and speak and to the living, the living Desert and to the Aquarium of the Pacific for the opportunity to come and speak with you all today. Um, so in my uh, two-hour talk that I have planned for this evening, <laughs> that's right, right? OK, a little less. Um, I have, uh, well, hour. I have uh, four main points that I want to share with you all. Uh, first off, I want to tell you a little bit about the vaquita and rhino, two animals that seem relatively unrelated to each other, but I'm going to make some arguments about them being intimately connected. Second, I want to talk to you about the title of the talk, Why Killing Poachers is Not the Answer. Third, I want to talk about the second part of the talk, which is some alternatives to uh, such lethal actions against people who are taking animals. And last, I want to share with you some ideas about what you can do to help this process, all right? The conservation of vaquita and rhinos. So that's the goal. So a little bit about where I am first. Uh, I'm very grateful for being here. Living Desert Zoo and Gardens in Palm Desert is uh, focused very much on desert ecosystems, especially areas that have wetlands in them as well. So the vaquita is well within our purview and just down our drainage system from where we are in Palm Desert. Uh, we work on projects in a dozen countries, mostly focused on North America and Africa, including the desert tortoise, western pond turtle, uh, Casey's June beetle. I'm an entomologist by training uh, initially, and the Casey's June beetle is an animal that's very near and dear to my heart. It's found in one watershed in Palm Springs. One watershed, it's about a mile and a half, two miles long, is the entire range of this species. So we're involved with, uh, with monitoring them and eventually into some captive breeding things, which is going to be really great for release. Uh, Peninsular pronghorn in uh, Baja, California. Uh, the vaquita, of course, which we'll be talking quite a bit more about. Cheetah, uh, scimitar horned oryx. Painted dog conservation in Zimbabwe. Uh, with Wild Nature Institute that works on Africa's giants in, in, um, in Tanzania, um, the re rebuilding the pride with the African Conservation Center in Kenya, and then, of course, eventually, <laughs> where did this count me up? Rhinos. 
Uh, and rhinos, we work a lot with the Black Mamba's anti-poaching unit, an all-women's anti-poaching unit that I'll tell you a little bit more about, which has formed the core of my research for the last about year and a half, two years. So the focus of the talk tonight is these two animals, the vaquita and rhinos. So let's talk a little bit about them in turn. First, the vaquita. How many of you have heard of the vaquita? All right, this is a non-representative audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a, a, a unanimous showing of hands. It's not a normal thing, and I'm very happy. <laughs> so you all know that the vaquita live in the upper Gulf of California. Uh, the vaquita is, of course, the animal in the middle of the slide, surrounded by the totoaba, who are going to be key players in our discussion. The uh, vaquita is a very small animal at adulthood. It's about four feet long, mother and calf. Oh, and they're often called the pandas of the sea for obvious reasons, right? The beautiful black lines around the eyes, around the mouth. They're just adorable animals. And unlike a lot of uh, small cetaceans, they're solitary. They don't tend to hang out with other individuals. As you can see, the vaquita are very small, smaller than a diver, much smaller than a bottlenose dolphin. And they're all found in the upper Gulf of California. Uh, if you know the geography here, this is Baja California, the landmass is mainland Mexico here. Um, three main communities in the northern Gulf. The yellow is the Vaquita Refuge, the uh, biosphere and fishing ex exclusion zone runs in the whole upper part of the area of the Gulf of California. Um, the vaquita population has been declining in dramatic numbers lately, mostly because of accident. They're a bycatch. Um, the man, this is a photo from the 70s. This is almost a full grown uh, totoaba, which is a drum species, species of fish. Um, and that is the animal that people are trying to catch. They lay out these gill nets, the totoaba get caught in them. And eventually, the vaquita, which you can see are very close to the same size, happen along, hit the net, roll, catch themselves in it, and drown. So the vaquita are critically endangered, not because anyone is specifically targeting them. They are purely bycatch. And in just the last 20 years or so, we have this dramatic and precipitous decline. 2016, there were 30. Now it's thought that there are many, many fewer than that, maybe as few as a dozen or even less. They are critically endangered, and they redu reproduce very infrequently, once every two years, with just a single individual. It's not a very optimistic future for the vaquita. As I said, much of the reason why the vaquita population is declining is not because of them, but rather because of fishing for the totoaba, and specifically, the swim bladder, right? the part, the organ in the fish that helps them regulate their position in the water column. And the swim bladder, which are what are in piles down here, is dried and sold mostly to Asian medicine, um, or Asian uh, dealers who make a soup out of it. And that soup is thought by some to have medicinal properties, some to be just tasty, uh, and some as a status symbol because it's rather expensive, quite expensive. But the swim bladder of the totoaba is the reason, at present, why the, the vaquita have been declining so precipitously. Prior to the fishing for the totoaba, a lot of the reasons why the species were declining was because of incidental capture in gill nets, or gill nets for shrimp. So the focus has changed in the upper gulf fishing-wise from shrimp, which are lucrative, but nowhere near as lucrative as something that you can get maybe $1,000 for in a single bladder, swim bladder. So that's the state of the vaquita at present, not a particularly rosy one. Now we move to a, quite a different animal. <laughs> uh, rhinos, this is a white rhino um, and her calf. Rhinos are targeted by poachers as well. Well, I should say also the totoaba is a critically endangered species itself. And they are fished and poached by people who it's illegal to fish. They are listed as a critically endangered species by the government of Mexico. So those people who are laying out those gill nets are doing it illegally and at night. 
So poaching is the main reason why the vaquita population has been declining. And the same reason um, is why this rhino does not have her horn. She was the victim of a poaching event. Uh, some poachers broke into this, this reserve in South Africa, this is on Makala, and uh, they, as they do with rhinos, hack off the nose, hack off the face. Rhino is, or the, the horn is a, is a keratin, it's a bony structure, and it grows. When you cut it off, it'll grow back. When you hack off the face of a rhino, very rarely do they ever live, at most one in 10. She's a remarkable success story, her name is Nandi. She's had two calves since then, since that remarkable survival rate. At the time when she was attacked, there were two other rhinos who were also poached in the same brutal way. This is often done in the most unsavory way that you can imagine. It gets me worked up. Um, using machetes, sometimes chainsaws. It rarely does the rhino ever live. They go as low as they can to get as much of it as they can of the horn. And unfortunately for the rhinos, there are five species. All of them have horn. It's a, in the name of a rhino, <laughs> which means nose horn. Rhino, rhinoceros means nose, rhino, cerus, horn. So all rhinos have horns, and all of their populations have declined dramatically. So much so that the numbers have vanished. Uh, the black rhinos at present are, there's around 5,000 of them left, and there were maybe as many as 100,000 only 40 years ago. White rhinos uh, have actually been increasing in population size, so they're up to 20,000 at present. Uh, Indian rhinos have about 3,000. Numbers are very slow in coming. Um, and the Sumatran and Javan rhinos both have less than 100. They're only found in the peninsula of Southeast Asia, in Malaysia mostly, in Indonesia. Uh, and the story for most rhinos is not particularly good, particularly for the two, the Javan and uh, Sumatran rhinos. On the upside, Indian and black rhinos have been increasing rather dramatically recently because of some captive rearing things. And white rhinos have been kind of more or less staying stable, despite being the majority of the target for this poaching. My clicker is not working very well. This is just the statistics for South Africa. You can see that starting in 2007, there were very few rhino poachings. 13 is 13 more than should happen. But it has accelerated dramatically up until about 2014. Then it's stabilized and it's going down a little bit, which is a little bit of a cause for hope. But this is one country. Over a thousand rhinos every year are poached. South Africa is a focus for rhino conservation as well because the majority of the world's rhinos, somewhere around 70, 75% of the world's rhinos, live in South Africa. And it's an interesting thing. We were talking about this earlier today. Why has South Africa so, been so successful with retaining its rhinos when so many countries around the world, across Africa, across Asia, have lost theirs? Most countries that had rhinos no longer do. Part of that is because in South Africa, they are on private farms, which is an interesting situation. There are people who own rhinos. You can own rhinos in South Africa and in no other country that I'm aware of. So, some people are mixed as to what they think about that, that uh, ability to own and farm rhinos. But for South Africa, it's been a great success. They have the majority of the world's rhinos still. Nonetheless, there's this great poaching that happens. And as many of you are probably aware, this poaching happens because the horn is so valuable that instead of a horn, you should really look at that protrusion from the nose, the seros from the rhino, as being pure gold, because rhino horns are at least twice as valuable as gold, more valuable than platinum. They're the most valuable illicitly traded substance globally if you don't count blood diamonds and such in that mix. Right? The most valuable illicitly traded substance in the world. Somewhere around $33,000 per pound. It's mostly used and collected for Asian traditional medicine 
And it used to be particularly commonly used in Yemen for the handles of these ceremonial daggers that every man has to have. Has to have. It's called a jamiya. You can see them over on the market or on the stand over on the right there. The handles were made out of rhino horn. Yemen made this, this decision in 1998, I think it was, to outlaw that. They were not going to allow Jamia handles to be made out of rhino horn anymore. And they were made with other things, um, resin, and other bone fragments and stuff like that. And very intimately, intricately carved and then embedded with metals. So Yemen, in one year, went from being the major consumer of rhino horn to non-existent. It's an astonishing thing, just based on one legal decision. Right? Nonetheless, aside from the success in Yemen, and despite what's happening currently in Yemen with all the wars, um, poaching continues apace for rhinos. This is a map showing the great reduction in the rhino range. Uh, these are the five different species where there were rhinos and where there are. And you can see that it's many fewer countries in much smaller areas. As I said, rhino horn is made out of keratin, the same thing as your fingernails, as your hair, and equally as useful medicine, medicinally. People often think that rhino horn is useful for curing cancer. This is a recent thing because one elected uh, official in Vietnam said that he had cured his cancer by consuming rhino horn. Right, one guy created this new demand. Uh, there it traditionally was thought of as a, as a pain reliever, sort of like an aspirin, only nowhere near as effective as an aspirin at relieving pain. And people often say, oh right, people like or to use rhino horn because it's, it's a, it's a um, I'm trying to think of a delicate way to say this, a male impotency problem solver, right? And that is not, was, has not traditionally been the case. What happened is that people, in, it's become the case, because people in China heard people in the US saying that it's good for solving impotency. And they said, oh, really? Well, OK, I'll use it for that too, right? Let's create a new market. So there's all this demand, and it's a gigantic demand. So there's lots of threats that are facing them, not just uh, recreational game hunters. This is, of course, not a rhino. Bonus points if people can identify what that is. <laughs> That's clearly an otter. Um, and uh, they're hunted uh, in extremis for game, for trophies. There's discussions about whether um, those trophies can be brought back into the United States, which at present they cannot. The current administration is considering that. In addition, through snare traps that are laid out mostly for meat, but rhino do get caught in these, as do elephants, as do lions, and everything else that might wander through an area. A uh, snare trap is basically just a wire with a loop, and you put your foot in it, and you pull, and the other end of the wire is rooted in place, and you can't get away. That's how a snare trap works. This was the photo of the year by National Geographic last year. And that, unfortunately, is what a rhino looks like when it's dead, when it's been poached. So. It's a very emotional situation. People get very angry about seeing these photos and stories of poaching and the dramatic butchery, and it's butchery that happens when people are, are killing these animals. There's wonderful media campaigns that are made. I am not medicine. I'm not a trinket. I'm not a rug, right? Putting the, the reader putting you in the case, in the place of the animals. I am not. Often, this leads into uh, extreme anger, where people celebrate the death of poachers. Right? And they talk about, there was a, there was a story recently where some poachers had broken into a, a, a game reserve near Kruger National Park in South Africa. And the poachers, I think there were two of them, were killed and mauled to death by a group of three lions. People celebrated this. If you go around the areas in South Africa that I work, you see this sign from this rhino revolution group, poachers will be poached. People are celebrating and warning and thinking that this is going to stop people from poaching rhino horn. 
Similar story, similar kind of mood about people who go out and try to catch the Totowaba and inadvertently kill the Vaquita. Great anger, right, among people who are wildlife lovers, animal rights activists, who rightly are en enraged by this. Advocating for the poaching of people. This is a, a feed uh, that I found recently on Facebook. Uh, two poachers were killed by rangers in uh, Kaziranga National Park, which is right near um, uh, Kruger. And this is just a selection of the responses to that image, to that post. Right? Celebration, right? dancing, yippee, right? the death of people. Clearly, they're doing bad things, these poachers. Is it a murderable offense? And does killing poachers actually act as a deterrent to people who might poach? Well, there was a study done in, uh, well, published in 2009 um, that was published in this journal. They went around and talked to uh, uh, dozens and dozens of criminologists in the United States who know the literature, know the data about just homicides, right? Does the death penalty act as a deterrent to keep people from, from killing other people, right? Keep people from killing other people, which is a much more personal thing than someone killing another species, right? If I'm killing another person, I can identify directly with that person, right? I identify with you as another human, even though I'm about to kill you. <laughs> I'm still identifying with you, so there's a bit of a hesitation there, even among psychopaths, right? Does the death penalty act as a deterrent? Uh, in 2008, that says 88.2% of these criminologists said no. It does not act as a deterrent. Where the death penalty is in place for homicides, it does not suppress the homicide rate. Right? So if that's the case, if you're a poacher and you're living in a poor area, and in the places where I work in South Africa, there's somewhere around 70 to 75% of the young men are unemployed. Unemployed, 70 to 75%. Three quarters of the population have no income stream legally, right? What can you do to make money? If knowing that you might be killed by rangers is a risk, if you have no other income stream, if someone were to come into your work and say, ah, I'm sorry, your industry is illegal, we're closing your doors, you're out of work. Right? Are you going to say, okay, well, I guess I'll sit on the curb and drink. <laughs> right? You're going to try to find a way to make a living to feed your family. So what poaching often happens or what often happens when we have poaching in areas, or poaching of poachers in areas, is a suite of things. First off, if the conservation agency is killing people who are poachers, you've killed someone as a ranger. You think their family is going to appreciate conservation? Are they going to be supporters of conservation? Is there, are there friends? Are there neighbors? Is their community going to be a supporter and think positively of conservation? Heck no. You have made a community of enemies to the very thing you're trying to make happen. Right? Is it a deterrent? No way. I interviewed 120 different community members when I was down there doing this, this impact evaluation study of the Black Mambas program and the impact of the Mambas on the communities that they live in. 93% of the people said no poaching is wrong. They should not poach. About half of the people who gave me a reason for why they should not poach said that I don't want them poaching because they could die and leave orphans or widows. Right? The other half said you know, they, they should be protecting our wildlife. They should not be killing our wildlife. It's wrong that they're poaching. People would say, no, I don't think they should poach because they could get killed by wildlife. They could get killed by rangers, as in those two earlier examples. 
right? So you're making enemies. It's not acting as a deterrent. And you're certainly not getting any allies, right? So killing poachers is, I would argue, one of the worst things that you could do as a conservation organization. If you want to conserve rhinos, if you want to conserve vaquitas, you do not kill poachers, right? Even though in the short term you might, you might stop that one poaching event, you're going to be escalating the poaching events over the long term, the number of poaching events, because you've made this whole community of enemies, and community and community and community and community of enemies, right? Every poacher leads to a community of enemies, right? So, if we don't want to do that, <laughs> And I would argue strongly that we shouldn't. Not only is it, is it bad from a strategic standpoint, I think it's unethical. You know, you're killing people who might be just trying to make a living. It's not the most legitimate of livings. They would certainly acknowledge that as well. But they're trying to make a living, you know. Often they're involved with drug running gangs and human smugglers and gun smugglers. You know, all this poaching happens in a established kind of order, right? <laughs> These are not the best of people that we're talking about here. These are not your Kiwanis members, you know? <laughs> these are international smugglers, usually. But these are the lowest rung of the international smugglers, the ones who are getting killed. The kingpins, the ones who are buying the horns, they're not out there getting killed. Right? So what can we do instead? I feel like clouds should part. There should be a ah, singing of angels. That's the effect I want to have with this slide, <laughs> right? What can we do instead? If we don't want to kill people for bad things, but maybe things that they might feel that they need to do, what can we do? Well, community-based conservation is a suite of actions, and this is really sort of my specialty, what I do. My role in conservation, I feel, is this, has become this, right? Um, my original training was not this. <laughs> my original training, I'm an entomologist by training, like Dave was saying, like I talked about with that beetle, right? I, I study small things. <laughs> I don't study rhinos historically, right? My PhD is in entomology, community, con community biology of, uh, of uh, uh, beetles and ants, mostly, using them as indicators for ecosystem disruption. But if you want to make a difference, I have learned, for conservation, it's useful to know that insect information. It's useful to know the rhino information. It's useful to know the ecosystem information, absolutely. But if you want to make a real difference, you talk to the people in the communities surrounding the area that you're trying to conserve and living in the areas that you're trying to conserve. That's community-based conservation. I've spent the last 20 years of my life retraining myself after my PhD, sort of my second PhD of life of sorts, uh, in this kind of realm. Right. So what, if we want to achieve conservation sustainability, if we want our conservation projects to be successful, we need to focus on local people and their interests in making certain that the conservation project that you're doing is of interest to those local people and that they will support it after you leave. Right? Unless you're doing a conservation project in your backyard, you are eventually going to leave where you're working. And even if it's in your backyard, you'll probably move at some point anyway, because we're Americans, <laughs> right? So we want the conservation projects to be so important and so valuable to people in the areas that we're working that they are like, yo, give us that. I want to do that, right? That benefits me. That benefits my community. That benefits my kids. That makes my world better. I want to do that. If you can make a conservation project happen that people are clamoring for, that they benefit from, that is sustainability, right? That's behavioral change. So that could be at the level of you know, maybe breeding birds and working with people to, to rear these birds and for releasing them, or maybe talking to you know, the village crazy people who have interesting ideas <laughs> about what's happening locally. I don't know who that guy is, but, or talking to kids, education, right? I told you, told you, Dave. 
You made it available, I'm using it. <laughs> the wonderful man. <laughs> um, because local people, no matter how deranged they may be or not, they determine the conservation legacy of your projects, right? They determine how successful your project is going to be in the long run after you leave. We need to work with local people. And what I mean by local people, local communities, right, it depends on the conservation project. Sometimes it's, it's living people who are living in South Africa. Sometimes it's people who are living here in Long Beach, right, if you're working on aquatic species just off the dock, right? So this idea of who is local and what is local is determined by the project. Who do you want to engage? Who are the people that are going to be the major stakeholders and decision makers and people influencers in your community? Those are the people that you have to work with, right? Whether that's in South Africa or domestically. Oh, this man, this is a cool story up on the, on the right here. Um, the man second from left him is Chief Manisi. He is the head of the Shlivakani people, uh, which is a community of a couple thousand people, um, m the community from which most of the Mambas came from. And uh, I had dinner with the chief. And it was one of the coolest evenings. And he was a very interesting guy. Uh, one of the coolest times in conservation that I've had was my dinner with the chief. <laughs> really a wonderful man. Anyway. Uh, oh, also, I should point out, this is the one basketball team that I was the star in. <laughs> right? I could stop anybody from hitting anything. It was great. <laughs> I'm a terrible basketball player, full disclosure. So community-based conservation. There's a lot of things that go into community-based conservation, and really it's as broad as you can imagine it to be. Anything, any project that you do, any action that you do that involves engaging people locally is community-based conservation, right? Whether that's education or starting out with a needs assessment or understanding getting the public to come and participate in as ideation sessions or, or brainstorming for how we can do this better, how do we make this valuable and useful to you, building capacity locally for maybe alternative fishing gear, like in the vaquita, which is something that's sorely needed, or alternative livelihoods that address those human needs of being able to have money to be able to feed themselves, feed their family, right? Sometimes it's simply just hiring people. One of the most interesting thing of that, that impact study, which I'll, I'm going to come back to again as well as an example of a community-based project, um, is that almost every single person that I spoke to, without qualification, loved the natural and protected areas around the, where they live, even though they couldn't go on to them. And the reason that they all supported this, this was in South Africa, is because those areas provided jobs. They'd say, oh, my kid's employed there. I have a cousin that's employed there. My buddy down at the bar is employed there. Jobs, 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 jobs. That is how in South Africa you get communities on your side, especially in a place 75% of the young male populace is un un unemployed. Jobs, 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 jobs. Conservation is jobs is going to be the title of my report. <laughs> right? Sometimes it's helping them figure out supply chains and sustainability, right? As in the Vaquita project, which uh, we're, we're, we've been working on all day today to try to figure out what we're going to do with the Vaquita project across all zoos and aquariums. Dave and I and uh, Stella, you are in here someplace too, um, are, uh, uh, have been working all day today to try to figure out what we are going to advocate that zoos and aquariums across North America, Mexico, US, and Canada, should do to try to help further the conservation of the vaquita. And one of that is to create a way for people to s collect, harvest, and sell uh, sustainably caught fish, shrimp, a variety of other things. And underpinning all of these actions, we need to know what we're doing. Right? It can't just be walking into a community and saying, yo, I'm here. I know the answers. Right? That, uh, that wins you never. <laughs> you will never be successful with that. 
You need to do research, you need to talk to people, you need to evaluate the possibilities that you're talking about and look at the impacts that you've had with your project. How big of a reach have you had? What has your impact been? And then those things tell you how you can be sustainable. Right? This is the smallest thumbnail of what community-based conservation is. Really, it's anything that you have done, if you have done anything in conservation that involves people directly, community-based conservation. So this is also sometimes called the human dimensions of conservation, right? You may have heard this term. How many people have heard of, of community-based conservation first off? How many of you? All right. How about human dimensions of conservation? Is that a term that you're familiar with too? Only a few. OK, many fewer. Um, but the human dimensions of conservation are another aspect of, in a subset of community-based conservation that are focused on the, meeting the needs of people directly. Right? And when I go in to do, either it's, whether it's CBC or the human dimensions kind of subcomponent of it, I go in assuming everybody's going to love me. <laughs> and rarely am I wrong. No, that's not true. I'm wrong all the time. Uh, that's the best thing about community-based conservation is that it keeps you humble. <laughs> you never know anything. Right? That's why you do the research. You go and talk to people. Well, I think this might work. And they say, nope, that's not going to work. How about if you do it this way, like, beautiful idea. Usually you know less about what's going to work in that location than the people that you're working with. So I assume that people will support the work and that I, it's just a matter of figuring out what they need. What's the hook, right? What's the thing that people will dig? What do they want to do? What are the, the situations where they will benefit and the goals that I have can be met? as a conservationist, right? There'll always be naysayers. There'll always be people who organize parades of boats down the main street in San Felipe, right? There'll always be detractors. You just expect that. But if you can bring them into the situation, if you can bring poachers into your work and employ them in a way where they would not be a threat to the animals themselves, but they benefit by it, jobs, 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 jobs. That's a great success. You want to be in it for the long term, but not so long, because you want it to be able to be something that can be sustainable and not need you. Right? So let's talk about a couple, so, a couple examples. I've given like the thumbnails of a couple examples about what community-based conservation is. Um, so that's the, this is the third of the four parts, what we talked about. So, Everybody knows who this sexy little beast is here, right? Ooh, so pretty. That's a California condor, of course, brought back from the brink of extinction. Low 20s of them back at one point, and now we're up to almost 500. It's astonishing. Half of them are in the wild. Peninsular bighorn sheep are an endangered subspecies of bighorn sheep found only in Baja. Peninsular pronghorn, also found only in Baja, a little south of here. This is the cordon, which is this columnar cacti that's, that dwarfs a swirl. It's found only in this one location on the east side of, of Baja California, just south of San Felipe down here. Astonishing. Also an endangered species. And then lastly, over on the right here is, of course, the vaquita. And I put these up, all of which are endangered to some level because they make this wonderful educational opportunity that we had built this, this educational campaign um, enlisting middle school teachers in San Felipe, the community right there, to try to teach them about the unique ecosystem in which they live. Right? The vaquita was a part. The vaquita is also a hot button issue in the upper gulf because as you can imagine with the gill net exclusion zone, San Felipe, which, which is and has been a fishing community, is dramatically affected by this gillnet exclusion ban. Right? That was the, the majority of the money coming into the community was through fishing. There is no fishing that's legal in that area anymore. That leads to problems. Before that happened, we were engaged in this process, this education program that we were trying to use to engage not just the kids, but also the communities. And it was a great success. This was done through San Diego Zoo. Um, we were calling it from the ridge to the reef, or from the ridge, reef to the ridge, more or less in Spanish, del mar a las montañas. Um, so going in the other way, from the ocean to the mountains. Everybody loves an alliteration, right? <laughs> so. All of these species are present 
on this very short transect from the Gulf of California up to the top of the mountains. And what we involved or included in that, we'll put that back up, is this message about how the vaquita are threatened and that this is something that is their pride. It's right, it's, it's Mexico's own because it's only found in the waters of Mexico. Something that came out of that program as well as just the larger Vaquita project as a whole uh, was this image, which was not produced by us, um, that was calling for a boycott of Mexican shrimp. A boycott that was ultimately just passed not too long ago, all, like in July 24th, I think it was, of, of just this year. All fish that's caught in the, in the Gulf of California that's caught with a gill net is illegal in the United States. And as I was saying earlier, when you have this kind of a message, what does that say to the community for their livelihoods? Right? So we've been working, um, Dave Bader, Director of Education here, who introduced me, in particular, with trying to create a sustainable seafood chain, a demand for the sustainable seafood here in Southern California, where much of the shrimp was going that was caught in the upper gulf. Right? So that ban that just came through in July has significantly undermined this possibility. But this still remains as a desired goal. Laws can be changed. Right? So when we're talking about working with communities, creating value-added chains to them is a very valuable thing. They'll get more money for less effort, or at least the same effort. Right? Similarly, community-based conservation can also be uh, just a, an outreach campaign, an education campaign, a, a culture change campaign, right? As in this case, which I just love this. La vaquita marina is 100% mexicana, right? This is our animal. It's uniquely our companion to demonstrate to the rest of the world our pride, right? And that's what that translates more or less as. So la vaquita marina, because vaquita means calf, right? Everybody knows that. So when you say vaquita, if you say that to a person who speaks Spanish, they're like, you're saving calves? Right, so vaquita marina is to clarify that. But la vaquita marina, um, if you can convince people in the upper gulf and across Mexico that this animal is theirs, right? They should be super proud of this animal, right? That's gonna hopefully lead to some, some behavioral change, some, some value shifts, right? And Fishers who fish sustainably are ensuring the long-term survivability of the vaquita, and they get bonus kudo points in my book, right? And hopefully more money because they're producing sustainable fish, right? So whether it's in the United States that you're, oops, United States that you're messaging about the vaquita, or you're messaging in Mexico, these kinds of outreach and education campaigns to try to sway public opinion is community-based conservation. Similarly, we have friends in very high places. Um, the most important picture, person in this photo is this man, <laughs> who's the president of Mexico. Uh, and this other guy on the right I, is some, I don't know, somebody famous, but he, uh, some kind of an actor, I've been told. It's Leonardo DiCaprio, of course. And he has, is, uh, has a film company that's called Terra Mater Produ Productions. And they made this documentary called The Ivory Game, which you may, how many people have seen The Ivory Game? Or heard a couple have, okay. Amazing movie, absolutely worth seeing. If you've not, go home, I think it's on Netflix, it's absolutely worth watching. They're making a movie about the vaquita. And during the vaquita CPR uh, intervention where last year we, as a community, global community of uh, cetacean specialists, educators, um, communicators, a bunch of different people, went down to Mexico to try to round up all of the vaquita to create an insurance population and encourage breeding, just as we did as a, in the zoo community with the California condor. We were hoping to do that. Turned out to not be possible. The animals are not possible to be able to be reared in a, in a captive human care setting. So nonetheless, while that was going on, Terra Mater was there doing a lot of filming about the vaquita CPR and about vaquita conservation more generally. And this documentary is going to be coming out at some point. We don't know exactly when, but in the next year or two. Please watch the heart. 
the folks who are making it have their heart in the right place. So that's another example of an outreach campaign, right? It's community-based conservation. It's swaying public opinion. It's leading to behavior change. On a smaller and kind of closer to home scale, you, 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 can go to these websites and learn a lot more about the Vaquita. Message about them. Talk about them on your social media. I'll come back to this as what you can do at the end of uh, our discussion today. But that's also, in this case, you are the community. And you are messaging to your community members, your other people who you know and are connected with on Facebook another form of community-based conservation. Right. So let's go to rhinos. My uh, presentation has not completely translated over well to whatever this computer is, so I do know how to spell rescue, I promise. <laughs> and educat, I know how to do that too. <laughs> not right now, but in general I do know how to spell that way. Um, so within Helping Rhinos, this organization that I founded here in the US, uh, extending an organization that existed in the UK uh, and in uh, England, a good friend of mine, um, we have three main focal points, which is to rescue orphans whose mothers are killed, rear them to adulthood so that they can continue the population. Often the, the orphans die because of dehydration usually. They stay with their mothers even after they're brutally killed. Protect the animals that remain and educate both in South Africa and across the, the North America and Europe too. So a big part of our project is that second one, the protection thing. The Black Mamba's anti-poaching unit in South Africa, which I've mentioned a few times. This is an all-women's group. They are unarmed. They are unarmed. That is a significant piece of information because they are out walking the fences in this game reserve called Balule, which borders on Kruger National Park. And the big five are there, so named because they're the things that are most likely to kill you. Right? The big animals. African elephant, black rhino, I'll probably forget them now that they're right on the spot. The leopard, um, water buffalo, and lions, thank you. That's always the one I forget. The most obvious one is the one I forget. <laughs> thank you. So those big five are out there, and these women are out there, both in day and at night, because they're patrolling the fences for any ingressions, uh, cross-throughs on the part of poachers. People will come in, if they're a poacher, they'll test that, and they'll cut, snip a couple of lines. Right? And if that's not fixed, they'll go in the next night. So they have to patrol this fence. They are the boundary of Kruger, because Balule is open into Kruger directly. So this is the border of Kruger, really right, this fence. So they have to walk this every night, every day. And they're unarmed. At night, they often go out in cars, thank God. Um, I had a vehicle that broke down, and it was an exciting experience at night, I might point out, while I was there once. Um, I was by myself. They usually go out in groups, so it's not as scary for them. <laughs> at least that's what I'll say to try to muster some kind of pride. <laughs> it was terrifying. Um, anyway, so they go out. And they take out the, uh, the snares, right? The snares that are po put out to try to catch um, mostly bush meat, game that's made into biltong, which is kind of like a jerky treat, um, which is the basis of a lot of the protein for the folks in the area. But in addition, those snares also catch, like I had said earlier, rhinos and elephants and lions, variety of other, everything else that, that happens through. If the snare hole is big enough, it'll catch the foot of whatever can fit in there, right? They go through and take out those snares and in the areas where they work, and they look awesome, <laughs> I've gone with them out on patrol, and um, they, uh, they exist in a society that is loaded with machismo. Right? Women don't wear camo. Women don't drive cars generally in their communities, in the tribal communities in which they live. Right? It's not a thing that women do. Women certainly don't go up to men with guns and say, no, 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 right? But they are definitely women, and when they go out on those patrols, they look amazing. <laughs> it sometimes takes a long time for them to get ready to go out on those patrols, but they look amazing. And they are so brave and so strong and have changed so much because of this community, this project, which I'll talk a bit more about the apex of that in a moment. But 
when they go out and they do those patrols, they take the problem of the sexism in the communities in which they live and they use it as a tool. It become, that's the weapon that they carry. Right? They take that sexism and they use it as a weapon because men don't like to be told by women. So poachers may be in the area or maybe on the other side of the fence and they're thinking about coming in and they see the women coming. The women don't even have to do this. They're just like, nope. And the men walk away and they leave the reserve. Right? So they take sexism, it becomes a tool for good. It turns on its head. Right? So in the areas where they work, they have reduced poaching dramatically. By some measures as high as 93% of all of those snare traps have, re have reduced the poaching in that area by removing all those, poach those snares. They've also cut the poaching of rhinos in half. Remember I said they were unarmed. Right? It's boots on the ground. They are out there patrolling the grounds. The, they see the poachers. They stop the poachers. Right? But most importantly, one of the values of the Mamba program, jobs, 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 jobs. They're, they're often the only breadwinner in their whole family. Right? In addition, they have this, this wonderful environmental education program that, that we've supported and worked with and, and have done some evaluation things with too, where they are trying to uh, educate the next generation of South Africans about the importance of pride in their local animals, in their animals. In the same way that we were talking about it with the vaquita as their animal, the orgullo mexicana, the pride of South Africa. So, I had said this several times, this impact assessment study, I was there for five weeks earlier this year with this wonderful group of women who were uh, our survey team. We worked together. Uh, amazing how many people you can fit in a Land Rover. And we went out and we talked to uh, all the Mambas, all the Mambas, and we talked to all the people in the, com in the four main communities from which the vast majority of the Mambas came from. I think it was like 94, 95% of the Mambas came from these four communities. So we went to those four communities and we asked, what do you think of conservation? What do you think of natural areas and reserves, preserves? What do you think of poaching? And have you heard of the Black Mambas? There are more questions than that, several that addressed each of those, right? And with the Mambas, we were particularly interested in knowing those same things, but also asking them, how has your participation in this program changed you? Has it affected you in your view of yourself, the view of you by your community, by your family? So what we found is that the Mambas are fundamentally changed, dramatically changed. They're proud. They say, they tell us that, that women don't do this. Well, I am doing it. Patrolling, making money, driving, telling men that they can't kill things. <laughs> walking in areas with the big five, including lions. And they are changed by this experience. And they change their family. They change their family's perception of them. Right? They are breadwinners. They are effective. They are proud. They are interviewed by the BBC. They are interviewed by CNBC. They are interviewed by everybody around the world. They have huge prominence. They are changed. The Mamba program is dramatically, I can't even overstate how influential the program is for them and their family. We also talked a lot to the, to the staff. That's an interesting thing that I don't want to go into just because of time. But in the communities, we had, I said I talked to those four different communities, right? In one of the four communities was the Bush Babies Educational Program. So the, the Mambas were going into the, into the schools, into the primary schools mostly, and they're talking about the wildlife, and they're dressed in camo, and they got those awesome hats, and the, the mamba's batch, patch with the crossed snakes, the black mamba, which is the most venomous snake in that area of, uh, of southern Africa. And they're talking to the kids about the, the amazing animals that live by them, right? In the three communities that they were not doing the educational campaigns, People absolutely did not support poaching for those reasons that I talked about earlier. 
I love the animals, we need the animals, they bring us lots of money, they bring us jobs, they employ my kids. But most of them had not heard of the Mambas at all. So the Mambas had no influence on those three communities, which is where most of the Mambas came from actually too. But in the fourth community, where there was a smaller populace, I think there was only six that were from this community, it's called the Maseki community, almost everyone knew of the Mambas. Why did they know the Mambas in that community? The Bush Babies Education Program, right? Because the Mambas are going in, they're talking to the kids, the kids are like, wow, awesome people. Mom, 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 guess what I saw in school today? Guess what I learned? Who did I learn this from, right? Almost everyone in that community knew about the Mambas. And they all said, oh yeah, they do good stuff. That's great stuff. They're, they're, they're making lots of money. They're bringing stuff into our communities. They should be out there protecting it. That's bringing us a lot of money to our community. Right? So what we take away from this is that if you want to create a whole chain of Mambas programs around Africa, which is our ultimate goal, you need that Bush Babies Education Program in every community that you want to change the opinion. It's the power of child, children's education. For those of you who are educators in the audience, that's a tangible proof right there of how you can change the world, right? The kids are changing their parents. You are changing their kids. So our goal is eventually to create what I'll call you know, all across Southern Africa, across Chad, Tanzania, these are all the countries that I work at in South Africa, McMambas, I want a whole chain of McMambas everywhere. <laughs> right? They'd be a lot more valuable and fulfilling <laughs> than a other chain that has Mick in its name. So this is, a, this is an amazing program. I am super proud to be a part of it, uh, a supporter of it. And so those are just a couple examples of what community-based conservation can be, both for the vaquita and for the rhinos, right? Just a couple examples. There's lots more that goes into each of those, those campaigns, those programs. But what can you do right here in Southern California, Long Beach, if you're from here? I think the better question is not what can you do, but rather what will you do, right? Because there's a lot you can do. you got a lot of options. I'm going to throw a bunch of them at the screen. Maybe some of them will stick in your frontal cortex, right? Because you have a lot of power. Um, as I was saying earlier about the rhino, um, and this is also true for the fish maw, the swim bladder from the Totoaba with the vaquita, most of the consumption of that is in East Asia. China and Vietnam are the two largest consumers of rhino horn. I don't know the, the statistics for fish maw, but it could be pretty similar because they're trafficked similarly. But interestingly, the third largest consumer of rhino horn, judged on confiscation, is us. Right here in Southern California, on the West Coast especially, and around uh, New York City area. We are the largest consumers. This is where the confiscations happen, right? Talk to your community, talk to your friends, talk to your family, right? Most of the people who consume it are engaged in uh, the traditional Asian medicine kind of approach, and you know a lot of people, and you now hopefully know even more than you did before you came in today about the impacts of that consumption, right? So reduce the demand, talk to people. This is the single best thing you could do. Talk to people about the poaching of vaquitas, the poaching of rhinos. Because we, not just the people in other countries, we are the reason why these poachings happen. Right? Not just China, not just Vietnam, the US. We have a role in this. Let's claim that role, let's make a difference, let's change that. Right? Advocate against the use of both the rhino horn which has Zippo for medicinal properties. Actually, I take that back. If you consume like a quarter of a horn, it'll be equivalent to an aspirin. So there's that. Aspirin's a lot cheaper. It actually makes an impact. <laughs> Use aspirin, right? And it's not gonna help with other issues that you got either. <laughs> uh, 
fish swim bladder. I mean, come on, there are lots of better fish or better soups than 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 swim bladders, especially from Totoaba. Engage with teachers. Teachers change children. We have a whole educational program. If you're interested in talking about rhino horn uh, in some fun, engaging ways for uh, middle school, high school aged kids, we at, at uh, Helping Rhinos have created these things. They're really awesome. We've tested them. We've evaluated them. They're really impactful. Um, you can, of course, fundraise for conservation. Bring some money in to help out with the vaquita effort, with the rhino effort, with conservation of whatever species or ecosystem that you're interested in working on. You can sign petitions. Petitions are not as influential as we would hope, but they give you a feeling of making a difference and keep people engaged. So they serve a purpose, right? Even if they're not actually changing legislators, having a list of names does show support for an idea, and that's valuable, right? And there are lots of different possibilities of places that you could go to. Ecotourism is a major draw, right? Like we were talking about with South Africa. This is the reason why people care about conservation. Jobs, 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 jobs. Ecotourism provides jobs. Vote. Good God, vote. It's coming up. Vote. Vote the environment. Vote your passion. You know, there's a lot that you can do with a vote and make happen. Share your passion. Social media is valuable. Be social. Share that stuff. Get this word out. All these messages are great things. And thank you for listening. And thank you for all that you do to help conservation in whatever ways that you do it. Because you are the community. Thank you. All right, we have some time for questions. I want to remind people uh, we're streaming live as well, so to have our audience outside also hear the questions, I have a microphone here, so we do want you to use the microphone for asking questions. Who would like to ask one? Right here, hold on. Hi, and uh, thank you. But do you think a black mamba-esque group for the Vikita would be effective? That's a great question. Would a, would a Black Mamba-esque group, which I, a word I like, Black Mamba-esque, Mamba. um, uh, would be effective for the Vaquita? I would say probably. You know, the, the Mambas are effective because they are boots on the ground. And they are out, they are the eyes in the, in the environment. If you had people out on boats, and they were patrolling things, and they could report back to someone about what was going on, I think they could make a difference, you know? Because people don't like to do bad things. I mean, I th most, most people don't like to do bad things. I'll say that, I'll hedge that a bit, right? Uh, and if you have someone watching you, you are less likely, this is lots of data to support this, you are less likely to do that bad thing, right? It's a good question. I'm gonna say hopefully. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things that would make that um, maybe more successful or, or, or more of a, a reality for, for success is that the people come from the communities mm -hmm. that are in and around and supporting the effort. Um, you know, so you, you certainly do have people on the water. You have Sea Shepherd that's on the water, um, but they are from outside the communities. There's, there's really no economy that's being driven by the other uh, enforcement efforts in the, in the boots on the ground that are in the water aren't supporting the communities. Um, the communities see very little from, from them, other than probably buying gas uh, or maybe going to a restaurant. So it's, it, I think part of, of, of the success of the Mambas is that integration within the communities that are also being impacted, that are, are producing the poachers. Um, so that could, that could be a difference as well. It's a great point, Dave. Uh, another, another Mamba question. I can imagine those societies, that idea when it was first proposed must have seemed far-fetched to some people. Um, how did that come to happen? How did they come, who, how did they sort of come into existence? Yeah, isn't it crazy? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it, it's really true. I mean, the, the idea of all of that happening, it's only been around for four and a half years now. It's still pretty young, right? So it's still in that kind of transition phase. It's still getting going in a lot of ways. They're expanding every year. They have new programs, new locations that they've begun. 
Um, getting it started was an interesting thing because it, it did not come from the community. Right? It came from an outside uh, conservation-focused organization, or guy, one dude really, um, who had this idea, talked about it with a bunch of people, not myself, like I'm a Johnny come lately, um, but other folks, um, and refined the idea and said, I'm going to do this here. He got money from, play, from people to be able to pay their funds, their salaries. Much of their salary comes from a, um, a jobs creation program from the government of South Africa. The other comes from you know, your pocket, a lot of my pocket. <laughs> uh, and um, that's how it happens. Once you get the jobs, people will do it. What's your crazy thing? Yeah, I'll try that. Is it a job? I can, I can pay my family? I can get food? You know, when you're desperate, crazy things are less crazy. <laughs> right? That's why people poach as well. Good question. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to ask another question about the rhinos again. Uh, the You showed a, a graph of the number of poachings in South Africa, yes. and it um, was very low in the early 2000s, yeah, like 13 or something. Yeah. So what changed? Because um, medicinal you know, powers uh, um, or perceptions of medicine that go back centuries. centuries. So what changed from that time in the early 2000s to now that caused us a huge ramp up in poachings? It's a great question. Well, I think what caused it, what started the process, this is again more conjecture than factual, affluence in, in China. Their economy started growing about then dramatically, right, with like a 10% growth every year. People have more money. They can afford more expensive things. A prestige item is rhino horn. You can improve, you know, when, like here, we have big dinner parties, and we show off the neatest things that we have, right? There, it's like, have everybody over? I can grind up some rhino horn for you. Would you like some rhino horn? That's what I think it is. And I'm not alone. Many of us think that. Um, but the, the correla it's, it's a correlation at best. There's no causative thing. I don't know for certain that that's the case. It seems logical. It, it tracks with the increase in Totwapa poaching. Does it really? It, Same time. Fascinating. Yeah, and Totwapa is not as expensive, but also very expensive as well. Mm. Other thoughts? Thanks, James. So one of the things I think the we, we, we both were in Mexico to work on the Vaquita CPR program and, and you know it, it wasn't successful and we did a lot of interviews and helped with a lot of interviews about that. And um, you know the researchers, the people who are deeply engaged in the in the subject, um, you know, are quite understandably angry. And and when we engage with people in the United States that uh, you know that hear about the, the situation with Rhino or with Vaquita. You know, there's a there's an an, an anger and a, a an externalization. It's the it's the Mexicans' fault, right? Or it's it's the Chinese' fault, right? And what comes of that? What I hear so often is, well, we need to enforce things. You know, we need to arrest people. We need to, um, you know, it's kind of the the only thing that can kind of happen to solve the problem, right? And you know. Enforcing a gillnet ban is, is, is forward as the only way to solve the vaquita problem. Mm. Where once the net is in the water and you're enforcing that ban, um, the net's in the water. The poacher's taken the action. It's gotten that far. No one's thinking about keeping the net out of the water um, where it could never do any damage in the first place. So a lot of what ja uh, James was saying right now in forwarding is we need more carrots fewer sticks. We have enough sticks. We have enough punishment to go around. Um, and it's not working. So finding ways to engage in, in positive actions that can work within communities to support the real base needs. Beautiful. You know, food, education. You know, base needs, not, you know, luxury items. That's what supports communities to turn towards sustainability and conservation. Mm. Um, not laws, regulations, uh, putting people in jail or to the extreme, you know, uh, you know, serious penalties. So 
anyhow, um, hope you guys enjoyed uh, tonight's lecture. Um, James, thank you so much. And uh, thank you guys for coming tonight. Thanks a lot.